I'm Denny Osgood. I'm the president of the, uh, the Dawson Maritime Group. We are absolutely delighted to see you all here. Um, we're the group that, uh, that puts on these kind of things. Uh, I will introduce Mac a little bit later, but I want to now introduce uh, Lee Murdoch. He is a Great Lakes balladeer and a historian. He's going to entertain for about a half an hour, and then our program will uh, carry on. Lee Murdoch. Thank you very much, Denny. Sweet Mother Michigan, Father Superior, coming down from Mackinac and Sault Ste. Marie. Blue water Huron rolls down to Lake Erie, falls into Ontario and runs on out to sea. The Great Lakes are diamond on the hand of North America, a bright shining jewel on that friendship border ring. It's a freshwater highway coming down from Canada and all along the coastline you can hear the people sing. Sweet Mother Michigan, Father Superior, coming down from Mackinac and Sault Ste. Marie. Blue water Huron rolls down to Lake Erie, oh, falls into Ontario and runs on out to sea. are the seamen on the ships that load the iron ore, hauling out of Thunder Bay, bound for Buffalo. And hardy are the fishermen, like their fathers were before they say, bury me at sea when it's my time to go. Sweet Mother Michigan, Father Superior, coming down from Mackinac and Sault St. Marie. The water Huron rolls down to Lake Erie, Falls into Ontario and runs on out to sea. Down below the quarter deck, old men mend the fishing nets. While up on the windy bridge, young men cursing to the wind. Up and down the Windsor Straits, the wives and mothers lie awake. They pray Our Lady of the Lake will bring them home again. Singing, sweet mother Michigan, father superior, coming down from Mackinac and Sault Ste. Marie. Blue water Huron rolls down to Lake Erie, falls into Ontario and runs on out to sea. Singing, sweet mother Michigan, father superior, coming down from Mackinac and Sault Ste. Marie. Blue water Huron rolls down to Lake Erie. Falls into Ontario and runs on out to sea. Runs on out to sea. Runs on out to sea. Thank you very much. This is a remembrance event, and one of the best ways I feel to remember days long ago is to sing the songs of long ago. 
and to talk about events long ago. And that's what we're going to be doing this evening. And what I like, like about the songs that the sailors sang is there's a real humanness. And it wasn't all solemn. They had a lot of fun while they were working, uh, working their tails off, so to speak. And uh, this is a song I like to sing, uh, of us all to sing together, a song from the tall ship era, and a song that was used at the halyards, hauling the sails up. And it's a song, a very simple song called Haul Away, Joe. Uh, and I'd like you folks to sing this line of words. Haul away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Try it. Haul away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Once again. Haul away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Now I want you to sing it with an attitude. <laughs> Haul away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe! Something like that, once again. Haul away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe! This was collected by Ivan Walton at a number of places back in 1932. And uh, most, uh, most of the verses came from a fellow named Robert Broken Bag Bob Collin of the Sailor's Home in Chicago. And uh, it's a wonderful version of uh, Haul Away, Joe. In Buffalo, I met a gal as trim as any daisy. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. In Bonnie's bar, I lost my coin and also Mistress Maisie. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. I'll make him in the Bonnie's bar and called out loud and long. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Ten able men come follow me, we're sailing with the dawn. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Away, haul away, I'll sing to you of Nancy. Way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Oh, now I have a New York girl who's just my cut and fancy. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Oh, Nancy is my New York girl and I'm a singer praises. Way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Oh, she loves me, she waits for me. Oh, yes, she does like blazes. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Oh, once I sailed the oceans wide to earn my rum and tatties. Way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. But now I'm on a Great Lakes tub as fat as any lady. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Oh, once I sailed the oceans wide for Chinese silks and spices. Way, haul away. We'll haul away, Joe. That narrow hold is full of coal, my bunk with hungry lices. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Away, haul away, we'll haul away together. Way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Away, haul away, we'll haul for sunny weather. Away, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Blade Howard. That's well. Give yourselves a nice round of applause. Well, this year, we are remembering many things. Um, here in the United States, it's the part, we're partway through the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, war between the states. But also, it is, uh, this year commemorates the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812. And uh, it is a war that has a number of different names. The Second War of Independence, sometimes it's referred to as. Um, if you're from Canada, it's known as the Invasion of Canada. Uh, <laughs> and I kind of call it a win-win situation, um, to give a modern spin to it, because at the end of hostilities, um, a couple things happened. Uh, number one, the British Empire uh, was a, uh, continued to maintain a strong uh, presence in North America. So that was certainly a win for the British Empire. And uh, for the United States, they were allowed to continue to exist. So um, it was a, what I call a win-win situation. Uh, but being a lost, memorials, uh, lost memorial service, I'd like to uh, nod to a, a number of people who lost their lives uh, on the American side of that war during a storm, not during hostilities, but during a storm in Lake Ontario, when the USS Scourge and the USS Hamilton uh, sank on uh, uh, August of uh, 1813. And uh, one of the survivors was a fellow named Ned Myers. 
And he wrote very eloquently in his later years about that night. And many of the words that he wrote uh, ended up in this song to kind of give us a first-hand account of what that night was like. And I simply call this the Ballad of Ned Myers. On the night of August 7th, in the year 1813, just an ordinary seaman, I was young and lean. I served for Isaac Chauncey on Lake Ontario. Aboard the schooner Scourge with the Hamilton in view. I was forward of the mainmast along the windered rail. There was no breath of wind to fill and swell a sail. But a rushing noise came from the lake then followed by a flash. When a squall thundered on our beam and rising waters crashed. That instant called for action and I sprang for the jib sheet. Then Leonard Lewis helped me release the topsail cleat. By then we felt the water surge around our chest so high. Twas then I knew our ship was doomed and surely we would die. Shrieks and screams filled the air as water filled the hole. The groaning of ship's timbers and the terror did unfold. Like it was in slow motion, the time seemed to stand still. When the scourge, her crew, and my hopes too sank into the chill. Many years have passed since I stood upon her deck And many folks I've greeted and many miles I've trekked But not a day goes by when I can't think of that night It's a haunting that is very real, fraught with fear or fright Someday when I am long gone at my eternal rest as other men find other ways for power to contest. Think on the scourge in Hamilton, warships among the best. You battled what they could not win, both time and nature's test. Thank you very much. Well, there's a couple other songs I'd like to sing, and uh, one from the Canadian perspective about an event that happened on uh, September 28th in Lake Ontario off of uh, the Port of York, back, which is what Toronto was known back in those days, the English name for it. And um, it was known as the Burlington Races. Now, the reason why uh, is because there was no, it wasn't decisive. Uh, there was not a win for either side in that battle, which in being indecisive, it was very decisive because it was last major engagement by the American and, and uh, British forces on Lake Ontario and uh, kept the status quo the way it was. And uh, to set the stage, there were 10 American vessels, there were uh, six uh, British vessels, um, and the British primarily had carronades, which were short-ranged very devastating vessel uh, cannon uh, guns, but short range, and the Americans had long range uh, guns primarily. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the British sailors were very, very savvy, very, very good, uh, and the American sailors were less so, and so the American vessels were slower. So that, maybe that's why it was called the Burlington Races. I don't know about you, but a sailboat race is an oxymoron. A good friend of mine said, 
you know, to get to some place in a sailboat uh, is really, really great, but it's really, really slow. But, but this is a, a, a military-type song that describes a sailing procedure right at the beginning of it. So it's called the Burlington Races. <laughs> There's nothing fairer than to see the billowing sails at Helm's Lee And make great haste upon a spree And watch the wake that it traces To run before the rising breeze Can make a sailor weak in the knees As we do our best to tease Speed from canvas and braces All up, stand by to attack, ready Make the sheets slack, cross the heads Sells them back and cleat the lines in their places Feel the surge of the wind See her deck rise again Hear the snap of the sails We're off at the Burlington races there was a time in our history when on these waters there roamed free sailing ships and bravery that many a sailor graces. On the horizon there was seen a fleet of Yankee vessels keen on sweeping Lake Ontario clean of British frigates and faces. All up, stand by to attack, ready, make the sheets lock, cross the Head says them back and cleat the lines in their places. Feel the surge of the wind, see her deck rise again. Hear the snap of the sails, we're off at the Burlington races. Captain Yo was in command, six frigates and schooners at hand in battle formation made a stand in defense of her naval bases. The thundering of the carronades, the booming that the long guns made, splintering masts and rigging splayed out like a tangle of laces. Haul up, stand by to attack, ready, make the sheets slack, cross the head, says them back, and cleat the lines in their places. Feel the surge of the wind, see her deck rise again, hear the snap of the sails, we're off of the Burlington races. A large explosion then was seen, which made the Yankee flagship lean and gave us a chance to make a clean break for defensive chases. Being undergunned and underway, we made off for Burlington Bay, but the Yankees, they just sailed away, called it the Burlington Races. All up, stand by to attack, ready, make the sheets slack, cross the heads as them back and cleat the lines in their places. Feel the surge of the wind, see her deck rise again, hear the snap of the sails, we're off at the Burlington Races. All up, stand by to attack, ready, make the sheets slack, cross the heads as them back and cleat the lines in their places. Feel the surge of the wind, see her deck rise again, hear the snap of the sails, we're off at the Burlington Races. Thank you very much. Let me retune this real quick. This next song is a, uh, was written by an eyewitness to the victory of the Americans uh, on the Battle of Lake Erie, which we'll be celebrating the 200th anniversary next year. I know that's kind of a strange statement to celebrate a battle. But uh, one of the things that I think is very important about this uh, remembrance is truly uh, it, we're remembering uh, or celebrating 200 years of peace between uh, the two countries with the longest unfortified border on earth. And that's really something to remember and cherish. Um, and uh, when I first came across this song, it, uh, or th this poem that was later put to a song. Uh, it was written by a fellow named John Bennett who served under uh, Commodore Perry. And it really describes the battle. And if you can get around the early 
19th century language, which some of us in the early 21st century might have some difficulty with. It's really fascinating. You can hear the, the braggadocio that is very evident in, in the Americans and really is kind of one of the, the uh, elements that gives us the uh, ugly American moniker that some of us think we deserve. But this is a, a song called Perry's Victory on Lake Erie. And as I said, it describes the battle. You Tars of Columbia, give ears to my story. Who fought with Bray Perry, whose cannon did roar? Your valor has gained you an immortal glory and fame that will last until time is no more. On the 10th of September, let us all remember, as long as the globe on its axis feels round, our Tars and Marines on Lake Erie were seen to make the red flag of proud Britain come down. Colombian tars are the true sons of Mars Who rake for an aft as they fight on the deep On the bed of Lake Erie, commanded by Perry They caused many Britons to take their last leave The van of our fleet was brought up complete Commanded by Perry, the Lawrence bore down Our guns, they did roar such terrific power That savages trembled at that dreadful sound The Lawrence sustained the most dreadful of fires She fought three, two, one, four, two glasses or more Whilst Perry undaunted did firmly stand by her And on the proud full heavy broadsides did pour her mast being shattered, her rigging all tattered, her sails all in ribbons, her wheels shot away. With you left on deck to manage the wreck, our heroes on board are no longer could stay. There was one gallant act of our noble commander Whilst writing my song I shall notice with pride When launching the smack that carried a standard A ball whistled through her quite close by his side Said Perry, those villains intend short to drown us But push on my brave boys, you need never fear And then with his coat he plugged up the boat And through sulfur and fire away he did steer the brave Niagara, now proud of her Perry, displayed all her banners in gallant array. Full 25 guns on board she did carry, would soon put an end to this sad, bloody fray. The fire of the Britons grew shorter and shorter. The signal was given to break through their line. From starboard to larboard and from every quarter, the guns of the Columbia gloriously shine. In the heat of the battle, whose cannon did rattle on the Lawrence a wreck with her men near all slain. Brave Elliot did steer and safe brought up the rear. By this grand maneuver, the victory was gained. Oh, had you been there, I bow and declare that such a grand sight you had ne'er saw before When six bloody flags that no longer would wave were laid at the feet of our brave Commodore The whole British fleet was captured complete Not one single vessel from us got away And prisoners, some hundreds, Colombians wondered To see them all anchored and moored on the bay Great Britain may boast of her conquering heroes Her Rodneys, her Nelson, and all the old crew But Rome and her glory ne'er told such a story Nor boasted such feats as Colombians can do so Colombians sing and make the woods ring And toast those brave heroes by sea and by land Whilst Britons drink sherry, let us drink to Perry And toss it about with a full glass in hand Colombians sing and make the woods ring And toast those brave heroes by sea and by land Whilst Britons drink sherry, let us drink to Perry And toss it about with a full glass in hand Thank you very much. Well, this is a Lost Mariner's Remembrance. And uh, for me, a very, very poignant story I'd like to finish up with um, is the loss of a vessel called the Rouse Simmons. Uh, the Rouse Simmons was your typical 
Great Lakes three-masted schooner that worked primarily in the uh, uh, lumber trade uh, for many, many years. It was owned by the Hackley and Hume uh, lumber firm out of Muskegon, Michigan. And uh, in her later years, she became well-known as a, a, a vessel that bared glad tidings at the holiday season. In 1911, um, Captain Herman Schooneman purchased an interest in the vessel and captained the vessel up north to pick up these small evergreen trees to convey back down to the city of Chicago. Now he and his brother August had done this for quite a few years and in 98 his brother August was lost at sea on the S. Thal. He, Herman didn't make that trip this year because he and his wife Barbara were expecting twins and I guess she didn't want him gallivanting around the UP in that day. Undaunted though, he continued the family business and was well known at the Clark Street Bridge more often than not around Thanksgiving time where you could step aboard and pick out your very special Christmas tree. 1912 though, 22nd of November, they left Thompson Harbor near Manistique, Michigan with a load of 5,500 trees and sailed into forever. In a snow squall on the 23rd early afternoon, she was last seen flying distress colors listing to port before she disappeared into a snow squall. The loss of that vessel hit Chicagoans hard. But as happened before, an amazing thing occurred when Barbara Shunem and the captain's wife continued the family business for many, many years to come. This at a time when women couldn't vote in this country. So I sing, as I sing you this song, think of the Christmas ship coming year after year and the look on the kids' faces as they pick out their Christmas tree and the sadness. And th as the vessel is lost, the word gets around and the excitement of the Christmas ship coming back. In the time of my life, that recollection often turns. The snow always fell knee deep, the ironwood stoves burned. The ever present distant sound of jingling sleigh bells combined with the cadence of stock and trade into a wonderful swell. The creeping of the days never fostered any fear. The hours spent on sleds and skates only slowly disappear when a special day arrived it came but once a year when to the clark street bridge we'd go from the dockside we would peer oh papa come look oh mama can you see i've been waiting for so long for this to come to be oh papa come look Oh, Mama, can't you see? Here comes the Christmas ship with all the Christmas trees. Now it was the Christmas ship that brought joy to us here. Those trees were grown up near Manistique and brought on down each year. Rouse Simmons was her name. Three-masted schooner was her frame. And the winter wild waters of the lake she always overcame. The set of her captain's face and the smile within his eye he electrified that chicago dock and all its passers-by but especially us kids with excitement that was there we'd bring home a tree from the christmas ship with holiday in the air oh papa come look oh mama can you see I've been waiting for so long for this to come to be. Oh, Papa, come look. Oh, Mama, can't you see? Here comes the Christmas ship with all the Christmas trees. Then one year it all changed. Well, as I can recall, I was in the kitchen playing by the stove as the shadows began to fall. A sun-warm winter day no clouds crossed the sky 
But the air grew damp, a storm rolled in, and the snow began to fly. Papa came through the door, a sullen look was in his eyes. The weather's been real rough up north, he told me with a sigh. He said the Christmas ship is lost. Then he just sat down. As evening darkened the room that night, a shadow cast o'er the town. Oh, Papa, don't look. Oh, Mom, I can't see. I've been waiting for so long. Don't tell this to me. Oh, Papa, don't look. Oh, Mom, can't you see? Where is that Christmas ship with all the Christmas trees? The seasons turned in time through spring, summer, and fall. And with most things, my mind forgot that Christmas ship after all. But one early winter's day, like so many times before, I wandered the afternoon hours away, kicking down along the shore. When she came in off the lake, I can still see her now. With the scent of pine and the deep green water gently breaking off her bow, and a lady at midship waving to me there on shore. And she brought delight to the children's faces for 22 years more. Oh, Papa, come look. Oh, Mama, can you see? I've been waiting for so long for this to come to be. Oh, Papa, come look. Oh, Mama, can't you see? Here comes the Christmas ship with all the Christmas trees. Thank you. At this point, we'd like to start our wreath dedication ceremony. Uh, it's been a long tradition in the maritime community uh, to uh, give a blessing and cast the flowers upon the waters, and we do that at this point. Uh, I'd like to call our honor guard forward. Uh, Petty Officer Nathan Willicke from the U.S. Naval Sea Cadet, the Great Lakes Division. I call forward Midshipman Caitlin McLaughlin from the Royal Canadian Sea Cadets Repulse Unit. What does it say? I call forward mid, mid, uh, mid, uh, Master Shipman, 4th Class Wade Folson from the Great Lakes Naval, Cadet, uh, Naval Academy in Traverse City. Do we have the representative from uh, Georgian College, Owen Sound? Did, uh, apparently they're not here yet. Uh, and at this point I'll call f uh, forward our bugler, Petty Officer Ross Matos. Bugles across the America, U.S. Navy, who you won't see but you'll hear is Corporal John Chaff, who is the Royal Canadian Armor Corps, and he'll be on a vessel in the Detroit River, and he will be playing Last Post, the equivalent of our tap. I'd like to call forward the clergy, um, Reverend Paul Ennis, no, I'm sorry, Reverend Paul Innes uh, won't be joining us from Mariner's Church. He had a medical emergency, it's so uh, I also call forward Father Ross Kohler from Holy Divinity, uh, Holy Trinity and St. Anne's Church, and he's chaplain of the Apostles of the Sea. I call forward John Jamian, director of the Detroit Wayne County Port Authority. I call forward Constable Wally Silvers from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Windsor uh, Detachment. I'd like to call forward Captain William Grafori, International Shipmasters Association, Lodge 7, Detroit. I call forward Camp Captain Sande Ryerse, Canadian Coast Guard. I call forward to join us Commander David Smith, United States Coast Guard, Detroit Sector.
And lastly, I call forward Captain Kathleen McGraw, International Shipmasters Association, Lodge 7. We are getting a salute from a vessel out on the Detroit River at this point. Captain McGraw, would you take and read the necrology for 2012? Captain Samuel Woodworth, Master, Captain Vance, 1844. George Sweeney, Deckhand, Captain Vance. Rupert Motherwell, Engineer, Captain Vance. Major A.C. Truex, Passenger, Captain Vance. Ramo Dumont, Mate, A.S. Field, 1860. George Abbott, Fireman, A.S. Field. Mr. Owens, Engineer, A.S. Field. Hoover, Ship's Boy, A.S. Field. Alex McKelvey, Deckhand, Pine Lake, 1912. Captain Catherine Nasiaka, Master, J.W. Westcott II, 2001. David Lewis, Deckhand, J.W. Westcott II. And finally, Captain Donald Erickson, Master, William Clay Ford, 2012. The custom of blessing roses started in July 1701 when the second command officer under Cadillac, Alfonso de Tonti, presented his wife with roses on the birth of their child close to these waters. He said, Noche Rosa sin espina. There's never been a beautiful rose without strong thorns. We ask you, Lord, to comfort us tonight amidst the pain of memorial, to the joy of rebirth. Bless these roses and these waters. Amen. At this point, I invite you each to come forward Pick up a rose, say your blessing, and throw it in the river.
Boy, that was a very, very moving presentation. Okay, we wish to thank the Canadian Ship Owners Association and the Lake Carriers Association for being the financial sponsors of the event tonight. Additional thanks go to the International Shipmasters Association. That's Lodge Number 7. Warner Petroleum, and that's a story that I hope Mac will tell a little bit later tonight. The Great Lakes Maritime Institute and the Flower Lady, Arlene Earle, and her sister, uh, Linda Kay. We also want to thank all of the organizations and the many volunteers that made this program possible. The rather impressive list of organizations is listed in the printed program that was given out tonight. That's the end of my part of the show. Who's up? I'm Mac McAdam, the guy that has put this all on tonight. Thank you, Denny. Uh, last year when we were doing this, and at this time last year when I was making the announcements, I, I did a dastardly thing and I prevented our flower lady, Arlene Earle, from going out and throwing a rose into the river with a blessing. Her husband was one of the mariners that we lost just a short time ago. Arlene, I saved a flower from last year's roses I'd like you to have it. Are you back there? Here. <laughs> Arlene is a great friend of the maritime community, uh, and, and, and she's been known as the flower lady for many, many years, and uh, uh, it's a great person to know. Also, at this time last year, I had the privilege of introducing Captain Don, Donald Erickson, and he sat over next to the window, and I imagine a uh, good many of you remember that, and uh, we were fortunate to have him here. He was a dear friend of mine. Uh, Don and I sat in our basement for quite a few different chats, and he taught me an awful lot about the... Uh, Great Lakes. I met him 25 years ago up in the pilot house of right up there. And at that time, he was in full uniform, and he was uh, describing to people on charts the, the route of the Edmund Fitzgerald and where he was, and he just entertained people, started out with two people, and before we know it, there was 30 people up there. And uh, I said, boy, I got to get to know this guy. Uh, and he and I did quite a few programs together discussing the, uh, the last days of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now, uh, we're going to learn more about him. Uh, I was looking for uh, people to call upon to help out. And Don was, what, 86 years old when he passed away. And many of his contemporaries, of course, went on before him. So uh, we had somewhat of a difficult time, but I talked to different people. Uh, many of you saw the uh, two pieces of artwork out in the Gothic room uh, by Robert McGreevy, and one was of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and the other one was of Captain Erickson's boat, the William Clay Ford. Uh, that was painted by Robert McGreevy, and I called on Bob to uh, ask him uh, his association with uh, Captain Erickson. And he wrote me this letter. He said, my fondest memory of Captain Erickson has, of course, something to do with artwork. I had just completed a painting of his ship, the William Clay Ford, and was going to be introducing it with a special evening at a gallery on the east side. I had met Captain Erickson only briefly, but had seen him at Glemmy meetings. Uh, so even though he came across as kind of a gruff and intimidating, I gathered up my nerve and decided to call and invite him to the show. After I explained that the Ford was to be the featured painting and that people would love to meet him and talk with him about her, there was a long pause. Then he said, what time do you want me there? He came in uniform all the way from the west side, staying the entire evening, spoke with everybody, and was the highlight of the whole event, Robert McGreevy. That's the way Don was. He, uh, he, he was always here to volunteer his services uh, and help out at any function that we had at the museum or that was sponsored by the museum. Uh, 
What I would like to do is uh, first uh, call on a good friend and have uh, him talk to you about Captain Erickson out on the lake, and then we'll ta call upon another good friend who will talk about Captain Erickson as a good friend. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Captain Jack Callahan. First, I'd like to thank Mac for inviting me here to honor Captain Erickson. Sailed with him quite a few years, quite a few times. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is Captain Tom McMullen, I spoke with him this afternoon, and he's uh, right now on his way up to Superior, Wisconsin, sailing the Stewart J. Court. And he did give me a weather report for November. He said it was snowing, blowing 35 to 45 miles an hour. 10 foot seas. Typical November on Lake Superior. For those of you who did not have the good fortune of knowing Captain Erickson, he was born August 7, 1927 in Superior, Wisconsin. Captain Erickson began his sailing career at the young age of 15 and joined the Navy a year later during World War II. While serving in the Pacific Theater, he operated an assortment of landing crafts, minesweepers, and patrol boats, and was awarded the Bronze Star. After the war, Captain Erickson began his lifelong imposing career with the Ford Marine Division, whereupon he soon achieved his status of captain and was given command of the motor vessel Henry Ford II in 1962 which time he was then one of the youngest captains of the Great Lakes. His steadfast abilities and dedication to his responsibilities, crew, vessel, soon led to his assuming command of the Ford flagship, the steamer William Clay Ford. <clears throat> he would continue to live out the remainder of his paramount career till his retirement. I was sailing third mate on the motor vessel Henry Ford II when I received a call instructing me to transfer to the steamer William Clay Ford via the mail boat. Upon my embarkment to Captain Erickson's vessel, I was escorted to my quarters and within minutes, over and throughout the entire ship could be heard by all aboard. Captain Erickson and his famous in a yielding voice, saying, tell that new third mate to come up to the pilot house now. Just so recently, being promoted to third mate, still struggling with some of some anxieties, I responded to the captain's call and ran without delay. Upon <coughs> arriving at the pilot house, I quickly opened the outside door without knocking and entered, un entered unaware that the front window was open, causing all the important notes and charting information to flow throughout the pilot house. Much, very much, to Captain Erickson's ire, he instructed me to get the 8.30 weather report, and I remained under his watchful eye for the remainder of that four-hour watch. Very quickly, I learned that Captain Erickson was a no-nonsense captain. In October and November of 1997, the ore mines in Duluth and Marquette went on strike. This jeopardized the delivery of ore to the Ford Motor Company. So we received orders to set forth, sail to and through the St. Lawrence Seaway, through the Anacosta Islands to Point Noir, Quebec. Once completing our voyage across Lake Ontario, we began taking on Canadian pilots. One stretch near Montreal, it was my responsibility to bring the new pilot up to the pilot house. Upon introducing him to Captain Erickson, my, the pilot made the unforgivable mistake of telling Captain Erickson that everyone calls him full speed Ruslow. 
I make it through this part of the river faster than any other pilot that sails these waters. His laughter aboard it quick, quickly. When Captain Erickson told him, not on this ship, Captain quickly pulled me into the chart room, told me he was going to a stateroom for me to keep a diligent eye on his pilot and do not give him any more than 70 RPMs. Just a short way down, down the river, the pilot appeared puzzled and asked me, is this the fastest the ship will go? I informed him that it was not. However, this is all you're going to get, Captain's orders. <laughs> Another trip down the seaway brought some excitement to the ship. I was now just beginning my morning watch when about 200 feet across our bow, an awesome view of two beluga whales appeared. It was the first time that I personally witnessed Captain Erickson set aside his unyielding attention to his vessel and get excited. He took to the loudspeaker and announced to all aboard, look over the, toward the starboard bow and look at the whales. It was quite a sight. One that Great Lakes sailors ever see. However, it was much to the chagrin of those who had been on watch throughout the night and were sleeping and were awakened by the announcement. During the summer months, we often carried VIP passengers. We were always given some information on the individual as to initiate conversation. On one occasion, we had the pleasure of sailing with the Catholic priest. Kevin and I were on deck with him, and shortly into the conversation, the priest asked Captain Erickson, what drew him to the seas? Was his father a sailor as well? Captain Erickson said, no, his father did not sail. He just became interested in the sea at a young age and pursued it once leaving the Navy. Trying hard to keep the conversation going, Captain Erickson asked the priest, was your father a priest? <laughs> Silence followed. Silence followed for a moment. The priest looked puzzled, and then just laughed. At Long Lake Watches, I looked forward to Captain Erickson's arrival in the pilot house. I believe that, I believe that most of his years as captain of his, his habits, as a captain, his habits never changed. A cup of coffee, sometimes a piece of banana bread or toast, was his first priority following, followed by studying the weather report. And last but not least, waiting to know what jobs the deck, deck crew had been assigned for that day. Captain Erickson's career, we had very limited electronics aboard the ship. Only a select bit of TV, no cell phones, of course, a newspaper only every few days. The comics were the highlight of Captain Erickson's day. He never failed to tell everyone what was currently going on in Lockhorn's marriage. <laughs> Captain was not only a remarkable ship handler, he was a teacher to all of us that sailed with him. He never ever failed to recognize when something was amiss on the vessel. On one occasion, he instructed me to look out on deck and tell him what was wrong on deck. I looked from bow to stern. I found nothing wrong. I believe we had 19 hatches with 64 clamps on each hatch for a total of 1,216 clamps. He instructed me to look at hatch 15. There was one clamp that was not put on. His attention to safety was always a number one priority. Captain Erickson was a creature of habit, and he, be he became a source of excellence in his profession. He pointed out to me what he chose to determine the moment to begin, in to begin his turns in the rivers, and one turn with the Pacific home on the river. Another began with a flagpole. Last but not least, to my amazement, one began with, with a specific uh, pine tree. He lived by these habits and altered these turns only when his, when his engines failed or steering gear was compromised. While sailing is made for him, on a clear day, 
he would sternly instruct me, do not, do not look out these windows. Begin your turns and complete it by radar. Only a valuable lesson learned, especially when fog set in. These became only a few of many lessons I learned and took with me as captain of my own vessel. Although at times, Captain Erickson's crew felt he ran a tight ship, so to speak. At the end of every trip and season, Captain Erickson was always looked upon and spoken well of by all that sailed under his, his well command as the company he worked for. He was a man of great integrity and values. When entering the dining room, all his officers had to be in jackets and no hats or caps were worn at the table. His ships were maintained to a level of excellency as well as his crew's safety. He was by far an excellent ship handler. One of the most notable events of his career was his unwavering, unwavering compassion for his fellow comrades. When with an agreement from his own crew, he unselfishly left Safe Harbor on November 10th of 1975 to search for survivors of the sunken Edmund Fitzgerald, which disappeared on Lake Superior, sadly taking, sadly taking the lives of all of its crew. I was told by a fellow shipmate that Captain Erickson debated whether or not to put his crew in danger, discussed it with him, saying, if I had a family member aboard, I would only hope that someone would search for them. Upon that, he set sail. Sadly, all they recovered was a lifeboat. Not only was Captain Erickson very supportive of projects to save the Huron Island lighthouses from falling into ruins, he was supportive and active in every museum activity. On March 18th of 1952, he was initiated into the International Sh Shipmaster Association. On March 25th, 1958, he transferred to Detroit Lodge Number no. 7. He was first vice president in 1961 and 1962. Lodge president in 1963. Lodge marshal in 1966. Lodge Sentinel in 1968, and Grand Lodge President in 1970. In 1994, he was a recipient of the Lewis Ludington Award. Captain Erickson sponsored me into the International Shipmasters, for, for which I am forever grateful. Fond memories never cease. Without fail, I never sailed past the Dawson's Museum in the William Clay Ford's pilot house without seeing Captain Erickson in the front window waving to all the passing ships. He will be remembered by all who, who knew him. His character, integrity, life is a testimony to all people. I would like to close by sharing with you something that Captain Erickson gave me, and, and I believe it may be what he read in the privacy of his own stateroom before embarking upon the disappearance of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Siemens Psalms 23. The Lord is my pilot. I shall not drift. He lights me across the dark waters. He steers me through the deep channels and keeps my log. He guides me by the star of holiness for his name's sake. As I sail through the storms and tempests of life, I will dread no danger. For you are near me. Your love and care shelter me. You prepare a haven before me in the homeland of eternity. You quieted the waters with oil. My ship rides calmly. Surely sunlight and star shall be with me wherever I sail. And at the end of voyaging, I shall rest, rest in the port of my God. Jack mentioned that uh, he had visions of Don sitting up in the pilot house waving goodbye, or waving at passing uh, vessels. If you look over here to our right, we have a chair, and that is the chair that Captain Erickson sat in, in this pilot house, and looked out over the uh, river. And on that chair,
Dale Lindstrom was a uh, crew member under Don Erickson, and I was just handed this uh, letter that he wrote, and let me see if I can read through it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not that he has small printing, but the printer had small printing. Uh, the 50s was an exciting time in my life, living in La Hattance, Michigan, a small town uh, of uh, 2,500 uh, on the bay of the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, brings back good memories. It was there the, uh, the Wilson Marine Transit Company of Cleveland, Ohio would hold their annual spring fit-out meeting. It was a gala event with women wearing their, their best and men in suits and ties and everyone wanted to attend. Uh, there were, uh, this was, they were held at the e Irmark Lounge hosted by Butch uh, Parasol and Ernest. The, the Irmar was a favorite watering hole for sailors during the winter months after layup. Uh, let's see, after looking at the old pictures, we were uh, a bunch of skinny guys looking to make the big buck more like a boat of refugees. It was at these parties I met Captain Donald Erickson. We have another freighter. Uh, Almost sounds like a helicopter. Uh, it was there, uh, something else, is it gave her something else to clean, he said, and only uh, son Eric John did the other stuff. While Joyce cleaned her way out and got ready to go back to uh, Taylor, they wished them, uh, they visited them in Taylor. Uh, Joyce is Don's wife. Um, Actually, I'm having a difficult time reading this. The print is really small. I apologize for that. Uh, I do have some other letters to read. Um, there was a gentleman that Ford Motor Company that uh, was the dispatcher, and he was the one that um, gave the orders to Don as to where he should uh, uh, take his vessel in service of Ford Motor Company. Um, Don Eric, and this is a letter from uh, uh, John Nye. Don Erickson was a highly respected Great Lakes Mariner. He was, at the time of his promotion, the youngest captain on the Great Lakes. Don was proud of helping young men from their uh, hosepipe and uh, marine academies develop into mates and ultimately shipmasters. Several of the Ford Marine Operations mates can attest to his help. Jack Callahan. Tim Dayton, Dale Lindstrom, Tom McMullen, Jim Nuzzo, Tom Oaks, and Mike uh, Zielinski would all agree. Don, through his shipmaster's uh, organization, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Coast Guard to promote and improve safety of the Great Lakes shipping, especially with pleasure boats and ocean-going freighters. Don and I had a mutual respect for each other. I deferred to his knowledge of ship handling and safety while he deferred to my applying Ford Motor Company's policies applicable to marine operations. A notable recognition uh, he and his ship's crew received from the U.S. Coast Guard was when the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. The ship was in, his ship was in a safe harbor behind Whitefish Point, waiting out the severe storm when they received word of the Fitzgerald sinking. The whole ship's crew voted to go out looking for survivors. The storm was so severe that the ship could make only uh, one pass through the last known position of the Fitz. They could not turn sideways to the storm for fear of broaching. Don and I, with our wives, enjoyed s socializing at Shipmaster's event. Also, just Don and I at Shipmaster's meeting and volunteer to help at the Dawson Museum. Respectfully submitted John Nye. Now, we've talked about Don. Uh, he was known as a no-nonsense captain. Uh, there were crew members that really didn't appreciate working under him because they weren't necessarily of the same uh, inclination. And uh, Don would see that they got a, a ride on another boat. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so he was a no-nonsense captain, and I he was well-respected for that. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you to know a little bit about the other side of him as a, uh, as a friend to others outside of his professional career. Uh, and I um, learned that um, 
Dr. Tom Bumgarden has been a long friend of his, and uh, they have not uh, an awful lot in common professionally. Don, of course, was a ship captain, and Dr. Bumgarten was a general surgeon. But they had one thing in common, they liked boats. And uh, I don't know how much uh, Don went cruising with Dr. Bumgarten, but I know Dr. Bumgarten went cruising with Don, and cruising with Don meant a trip on the freighter across Lake Superior. And during that time, I guess they had spent a lot of time uh, chatting and telling war stories. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Bumgarten. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a real privilege to uh, be called on to address you and to talk about our good friend, Don Erickson. I was, I, you heard that, that we had the privilege of being on the William Clay Ford. And uh, I must go back a little bit and tell you a little about the, how we were tied up there. When I was a student and we lived in Grosse Point. Uh, the, uh, I went to Trombley School, and the principal there had a system whereby that you were given your year's work, and you could, you could either do it in a hurry or you could do it slowly or not at all. Well, I and my father spent most of our time, I think, in the principal's office. We, we were, uh, in other words, she was trying to convince him that look at you got a dumb kid here and uh, he was convinced that he didn't have so he decided at this end of the sixth grade when we had to leave the school to send me to Detroit University School otherwise known as DUS in those days it's still at Cook Road and Mac only now known as University Liggett um, at the time of my graduation uh, Bill Ford was a classmate of mine at the school. And the, the man who conducted the ceremony was his father. Uh, and uh, Etzel Ford, which, uh, and he presented me with a big silver trophy for the highest marks in the school. He also presented me with a book that was appropriately signed called Leader by Destiny. I've treasured this since then. The uh, trophy was passed on, it was passed on at that time from year to year to the person with the highest marks in school. Well, needless, needless to say, the next day, my father made a trip to the principal's office carrying the trophy and the book. And said, this is that dumb kid that you've been talking about. And uh, he ended up with the highest marks in the school. Well, when I first went to school, my father uh, took me over and talked to uh, the head of the school. And he said, now what do we got here? Uh, he said, well, give us a year and we'll tell you. Well, the time went on and it worked out and I enjoyed it very much. Kathy and I were privileged to have a ride, or a trip, I should say, on the Edmund or on the uh, William Clay Ford. And the um, when we were, uh, Kathy is always an adventuresome sort of a person. And Kathy is my wife, and we were walking down the catwalk around the the, the boat, and you can, when you see the picture here, you. You can see the catwalk there. And it was all, it had a rail around it. It was all, we thought, very safe. Well, a man came running down the catwalk and said in a very stern voice, the captain wants to see you in the pilot house. Well, we went up there after arguing with him for a while, but it was obvious that the captain wanted to see us in the pilot house. And there we were dressed down in no uncertain terms and told that never again should we go out there alone. Particularly, it was a quiet day, very quiet, and we thought perfectly safe. But he told us in no uncertain terms that he did not want that to happen again. 
Uh, on that same trip, he asked Kathy whether she would like to steer the boat. And she said yes. Well, it wasn't long after that that we had a radio message coming over from a boat that was coming behind us. Captain, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, yes, I've got a, a lady up here steering the boat and she doesn't know any, what she's doing. <laughs> but he reassured the captain following us that he was all right and the boat was gonna do all right. I enjoy collecting nautical artifacts and I am a member of the Lodge 7, the Ship International Shipmasters Association. And I decided years ago to have the Lodge and its members over for a, a cookout, a barbecue. And I bought a, one of these, it looks like a trailer, a big uh, truck wheels on it, and uh, it was enough you could, you could you could feed an army with it, but I figured, okay, for the shipmasters, that's what it'll take. And we had a great time, and Don was there. And uh, I thought, boy, here's a great chance to talk to someone who's been around the horn. And I said, Don, one of my Chadburns, and incidentally, for those who are not familiar with a Chadburn, is that control you keep seeing up there with the handle but come back and forth. It, uh, I said, one of my Chadburns, which is an old, old Chadburn, said, engine running wrong. I said, what do you mean, engine running wrong? Well, he said, the old steamboat, depending upon which side of the wheel that would turn, when they put the steam to it, it would turn this way, or if it were this way, you'd turn that way. And he said, this way, the captain could run back, send a message down that the engine was running wrong. Well, I appreciated knowing that, and uh, the uh, I think that uh, we can typify Don best by what uh, Jack was had told us about going out from a safe harbor. Harbor. He was he was in a safe harbor with his crew, and he took his vessel out into the storm where a vessel was going down. And I think this was typical of him, thinking only of the people out there and what he could do for them. I made the mistake of saying to him, did you take a vote of the crew? And he looked at me and he said, no, I didn't take a vote of the crew. I'm the captain and what I say goes. And that was it. Uh, so I, I learned never to say that again or challenge him in any way. But uh, it, I think this typifies Don more than anything else, going from a safe harbor where he was secure and out of the storm, out into the storm that was already taking a boat down. And I think that uh, it's something that uh, is very characteristic of Don. Don was one of the finest men I've ever known. And I'm, I feel very privileged to have known him and to uh, have known his wife, Joyce, and uh, the, uh, all the things that go with it. At any rate, uh, I told my son, I said, Tommy, my talk's going to be short. He said, Dad, that's the best kind. <laughs> and so with that, I'll thank you very much. Tom was up there at uh, Harsons Island when Don and I had our uh, uh, Don's last uh, uh, discussion on the night it, the fits went down. Uh, I said I had a couple of letters to read. I have one more. This is a short one. Uh, it says, I'm unable to accept your personal invitation to attend the Dawson Great Lakes Museum Lost Mariners Remembrance Program and will be, that will be honoring uh, Captain Donald Erickson. It is with pride and respect that I recall Captain Erickson as the master of the William Clay Ford and uh, his service to Ford Motor Company. 
He will continue to be remembered by all of the maritime community for his bravery when reflecting on the tragedy of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Your program is a fine tribute to him and other mariners who were lost at sea, and their memory lives on through your organization. Signed, sincerely, William Clay Ford, Sr. Well, our program is called the Lost Mariners Remembrance Program. It's always held on November 10th, the anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And uh, back, oh, eight or 10 years ago, um, uh, Reverend Engels and myself were having lunch and I looked at him and I said, you know, there's been so many stories told about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Everybody's heard him many, many times, uh, but there was, 6,000 other shipwrecks on the Great Lakes with many, many losses of life. And uh, most of them people don't know anything about. Some of them were very historically significant. Uh, and maybe what we should be doing is rather than retelling the story of the Fitzgerald over and over again, we should select a vessel and tell its story, whether it sank 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or 150 years ago. So each year, we select a vessel uh, on one of the anniversaries of a quarter century and uh, tell its story. Uh, so each year, we feature a, a different vessel in that regard. Some of them are more historically significant than others. Um, and what we decided on this year was we haven't told the story about vessels that have sunk right here in our own front yard in the Detroit River. So at this point, I'd like to call Joel Stone, the curator of the Dawson Museum, forward to the Pine Lake. Uh, thank you very much. Um, boy, having stood outside there and listened to that wonderful presentation, um, I, I'm kind of sorry that I have to add something to it. Um, it, it was important that we remembered Captain Erickson and uh, I congratulate Mac for not only um, putting this together every year and making it a, a, a wonderful event, but for also having the, uh, the, the knowledge, the forethought, the ability to put together something for Captain Erickson. He was important to the maritime community here in Detroit and very, very important to this museum. This year's program is going to be different in that, first of all, it's going to be short. Um, we, we spent a good deal of time doing what we needed to do. Um, it's also going to be different in that, like Don Erickson, it recalls the loss of but a single life, um, a sailor al aboard the, uh, the Pine Lake. In years past, we have uh, ventured well out with the Marquette and Bessemer II, which disappeared on Lake Erie. Um, we've talked about Lake Michigan and the loss of the Lady Elgin and hundreds of people that were, were on that ship. Um, last year, Bob McGreevy did a wonderful program on the sinking of the Keystone States, which again was 33 people committed to Lake Huron. And every year we talk about the Fitzgerald and Lake Superior. So Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, finally, for the first time this evening, this program comes home to the Detroit River. Um, once the busiest waterway in the world, and from many of the skippers I've talked to, one of the more annoying waterways on the Great Lakes, um, if we include the St. Clair Flats for you folks up from Harsons Island. Um, in developing this program each year, Mac and Tony Gramer and Rebecca McDonald, Rebecca McDonald I want to make a call out for because it, what Mac doesn't do, Rebecca does, does a wonderful job of putting this together. We look for anniversaries. We look for centenaries in particular, and this year was a doozy. Of course, uh, we had the HMS Titanic was highest on everyone's list. Um, that was lost back 100 years ago in April, 1,500 people. Here on the lakes, our most notable century mark this year was the Rouse Simmons. Oops, I missed the Keystone States. There's the Rouse Simmons. Um, the Rouse Simmons, which was the Christmas tree ship. Wonderful stories, but still lost with all hands. Um, May 1912, 100 years ago, 
The city of Detroit three, from whence our Gothic room came, set out from her fitting out berth right over here, the foot of Orleans Street, and promptly ran down. Here's the city of Detroit three, big boat, promptly ran down a little boat. The Joseph suit, the suit's wreckage was later dynamited to clear the channel, but the casualty list, no lives lost. And over three centuries of navigation along this river, there have been hundreds, hundreds of collisions and founderings every year, uh, dozens, thousands and thousands of groundings, and yet most have the very same story, no lives. Of course, the strait system between Lake Huron and Lake Erie is a tough bit of water, fast water, uh, silty flats, twisting rivers. It's particularly tough in three places, up at the St. Clair Flats, um, right here at the head of the river. This would be the, the Belle Isle Lighthouse, uh, where the Coast Guard Station is now. And you just you look at the number of boats in just one shot there. And then down in the lower river. And if we're looking for anniversaries, 1912 was big for the lower river. The new Livingstone Channel had been carved out of solid rock, lowering the depth to 20 feet for a length of 12 miles. This was indeed quite a feat. There's the William Livingstone, the first vessel to pass through the Livingstone Channel. Um, you'll notice it's going through light. They tried a light boat, they tried a boat a little bit heavier laden, and then they sent a full boat through just to make sure that it worked. Um, but a big year for that. And between October 19th and the close of navigation, December 14th that year, 1,200 ships went through the Livingstone Channel, just to give you an idea of how many boats go down. By contrast, the flats, the St. Clair Flats, became an internal improvement poster child. Here's a picture of a, a chart from 1847. And starting about 1847, right up through the... Uh, the current time, there has been a negotiation and fighting for monies to keep it dredged. People actually used to take the North Channel because the South Channel was so clogged up. They'd go the North Channel, they'd go the, the Middle Channel, which would spit them out into Anchor Bay, very, very shallow waters, but the South Channel, the faster way, was even harder. Um, the third navigational issue on the, the river here was right here at the Belle Isle Turn. Um, deep water, fast currents, America's first superhighway. In 1912, 100 years ago, traffic past these windows was 26,465 registered vessels. Um, according to the Lake Carriers Association, one vessel every 13 minutes and 10 seconds. Uh, and of course, during the high season, much more than that. And this didn't count tugs, ferries, or sand boats. And ironically, the Pine Lake was a sand boat. She finished her days that way, and so she's not even included in this number. Um, vessels nego negotiated quick set of turns through shifting currents without navigational aids. Collisions were common, and groundings occurred frequently. Um, collision, though, was not the only danger. There's the, the turns that you'd make coming around, and you'd notice that Belle Isle is not quite as pointy on either end as it is today. Um, this added to some of the, the problems they had navigating them. Um, back 19, or 1844, this is 1837, but the river looked much like this. Uh, the first recorded disaster, uh, major disaster, was explosions. Uh, of course, steamboats had a propensity to do that. Uh, Samuel Woodworth, the first name on our necrology. Um, son of Uncle Ben Woodworth, who was the city's most famous, most popular ho hotelier. Um, Sam was the master of a 90-foot side wheeler, the General Vance. Um, probably like the boat off to the left-hand side there, relatively small, and it traveled back and forth. It was sitting at the Windsor Dock when the boiler blew and took with it not only Sam Woodworth, but George Sweeney of Chatham, Canada West at that time, Rupert Motherwell, who was an engineer of a ferry boat tied up next to the General Vance, who had just walked on board. And then there was a, a, a major Truox who lived, came from Trenton, and uh, he was merely a passenger. It's hard to imagine this type of conflagration out in the middle of the wilderness, but in 1860, such a concussion was described in the Detroit Advertiser. At about 15 minutes before 9 o'clock last evening, buildings several blocks from the river trembled as if started from their foundations and sudden alarm seized upon all. In a few moments, the cause was known. The boiler of the steam tug A.S. Field, lying at a dock between Bates and Randolph Streets, had exploded, and the boat was a total wreck. 
probably a boat not unlike the champion here pictured coming down past the north end of Belle Isle, Peach Island off to the, the right there. Um, boiler parts, lumber were thrown for hundreds of yards and of the seven people aboard, four were killed. Today we think of a single upbound and a single downbound lane. A century ago, it was I-75. <laughs> I, I, I think this is a rather, a rather fictitious drawing, but I can see at least four collisions about to happen <laughs> in, that, in that picture. Um, by the time the Pine Lake was running, the sailboats would have been gone. It would have been all powered vessels that were, were vying for water space. On October 22nd, the Detroit Free Press wrote, uh, reported that the Pine Lake had been struck by the Fleetwood. Fleetwood, and here's the Pine Lake as a lumber hooker. Um, typical lumber hooker, 137 feet long, 28 feet wide. Worked out of Grand Haven, Michigan for a while, worked out of Buffalo, and then in 1909 was bought by John McCurchy, uh, a Detroit merchant who was with C.H. Little Company, and he converted it to a sand sucker. Um, which was a, a, a lousy name for a vessel that actually had a very important job. It either would go out and harvest sand, which was used in everything from castings for steel to, to cement. Um, it would also pick up the silts that, uh, that built up around, and, and it was early dredgers. We needed sand suckers, as bad as their term was. Um, the Pine Lake took the collision on the starboard stern, just a beam of the smokestacks, um, and she sank within minutes. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the weather had been not notably uncertain that year. They'd had uh, a very cold winter, a very dry fall, uh, so it was unstable. But that's not mentioned. I think more likely the biggest problem was a third party, the upbound o uh, Tug Ohio. Um, here's a picture of the Fleetwood, much, much larger than the Pine Lake. The three ships exchanged signals, but clearly they were misunderstood. One person aboard the Pine Lake said that our first signal was one blast, and the other vessels came back with two. We gave the danger signal, again followed by one blast, and again the other boats came back with two. Uh, within seconds, Captain Ferguson of the Pine Lake ordered the helm hard a port, hoping to beat the bow of the Fleetwood. Uh, not quite so lucky. Close, but not quite so lucky. Instead, the boat took a clean blow to the near the engines, and the end was obvious. There was just enough time to lower the yaw boat, most of the crew escaped, some of them being pulled out of the portholes, and the ship's boat from the Fleetwood was launched, and it did rescue one man from the Pine Lakes. Boom. Um, the party landed directly downstream of the wreck, which was just, just up the way here. Uh, would have been between the range lights leading into the river. So that as soon as they got in the boats, they came to the head of Belle Isle, the, uh, the keeper of the Belle Isle Lighthouse, which again is down where the Coast Guard Station is. Um, had a big fire going and soon put them in a wagon and they went off to a, uh, a, a, a forge because the fort of course is very warm so they could get their, get their uh, body temperature up. They then went to some of the local pubs where they had a story to tell so they probably got a few free beers and by the time they actually made it to town later in the day, um, in the next morning, the vessel owner was there. He took them to a haberdasher, bought them all new clothes and in fact the haberdasher threw in half the clothes to um, to make up for their losses. Um, unfortunately, it, days of searching failed to turn up any signs of Alex McKelvey. He was a single man from Glencoe, Ontario, and there were rumors circulated immediately afterwards that he'd been picked up by a passing boat, but these proved unfounded and he was eventually given up for lost. Uh, the wreck sat 24 feet of water amidst the windmill point range lights and lanterns were put on it until it could be dynamited out of the way. Notably, on November 10th, 100 years ago, documents for the Pine Lake were surrendered at Detroit, the entry reading vessel lost. Uh, blame for the accident wasn't awarded for many years. Um, it went around and around, but it was at a time when the vessel collisions and deaths were falling rapidly. 1909, there were 125 collisions on the Great Lakes and the loss of 121 crewmen. Three years later, in 1912, there were merely 50 collisions and only 33 lives lost, 21 of them mariners. 
This area is dangerous, there's no question. In September of 1905, same spot, the W.B. Castle was a tugboat, collided with the Robert Holland on the Detroit River. Um, no lives lost. Um, following year, the America went up on Ballard's Reef down at the lower river. The Tajmu struck ground there in the 30s, again, made it to Amherstburg, no lives lost. Every one of the ferries that carried uh, people and every one of the ferries that carried uh, railroad cars suffered some collision during their time. On to the Montrose. It was 50 years ago, a good anniversary to remember, and gratefully again, no lives lost. It had transferred some Italian marble and some stonework and some fruit and some wine off at the Detroit Harbor Terminals and was departing, um, heading upriver. They were heading to uh, Port Arthur to pick up some wheat, uh, pulled out into the river to get to the Canadian side in the upbound track, and as they pulled out, they f just failed to see a barge full of cement clinkers coming at them. 1,600 tons landed right in the side of the Montrose. Uh, she rolled over quickly. Um, luckily, the, the Detroit Police Harbor Master, the, the J.W. Westcott, um, and, and, and a bunch of, of pleasure boats were all there and were able to get most of the crew off. Uh, the accident happened about 9.30. Um, by 1 o'clock, it had become untenable for the captain and two of his officers to stay, and they were lifted off also. Um, they eventually pulled the boat up, but it was quite, a, it was quite an event. 40,000 people rushed to the Detroit side of the river with a similar contingent on the Canadian side. Uh, they had to put traffic cops out. It was, it was really quite a thing in Detroit to go and see the Montrose sitting under the Ambassador Bridge. Um, at one point, they, they stopped letting people walk. You used to be able to walk on the Ambassador Bridge, and they, they closed off that traffic. Um, Again, because of the tremendous resources, many we saw here today represented um, no lives lost. While a busy and challenging, the life-saving and navigational support organizations of our two nations have continued and combined over nearly two centuries to make this, while one of the busiest, one of the safest waterways and maritime environments in the world. Despite the finest preparations and skilled seamen, there is still danger. And it would be inappropriate in a discussion about our river, not to mention Captain Catherine uh, Nasatiatka and uh, Dave Lewis, the JW Westcott too. They were lost to the Detroit River Maritime Fraternity 11 years ago. We chose a nondescript vessel for our signature this year a vessel that most have never heard of, and only one man was lost. But McKelvey, Alex McKelvey, represents men and women, so many nameless, who have perished at sea, some very close to this beach. And tonight we honor them. Thank you. A couple of things. Uh, incidentally, the uh, Pine Lake sank at exactly 7.10 when we put the wreath in the uh, river this year. 7.10 was the time that the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. Um, we also uh, went out and cast roses. Uh, actually, I think they were carnations over the um, site of the Montrose sinking uh, early this year on the uh, anniversary of its sinking. We did recognize that. I have one last personal remembrance uh, of an avid Great Lakes Mariner, Dr. William Van Kirk of Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, William Van Kirk not only sailed the four corners of the Great Lakes, and I mean the four corners of the Great Lakes, uh, he retired and went on to sail the four corners of the world. A little over a week ago, Willem passed away in his home uh, land of uh, the Netherlands. And I have this rose here, and Elsbis. I will, Elsbeth is his wife, who also sailed with him, Elsbeth. I will be casting this rose into the waters of the Great Lakes, symbolizing one last crew, uh, cruise for uh, Willem. Uh, at this point, Lee.
The legend lives on from the ship on down Of the big lake they call Gitchigumi The lector said never gives up her dead When the skies in November turn blue With the load of iron ore 26,000 tons more Than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed in But that good ship and crew were bound to be true When the gales of November come early The ship was the pride of the American side Coming back from some hill in Wisconsin And as big freighters go, she was bigger than most With a good crew and captain of the Caesar Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms she left for an old infantry And later that night When that ship smell rang Could it be the north wind They'd been feeling Wind in the wires Made a tactile sound As the wave broke over the rainbow And every man knew As the captain would do T'was the witch And all the hammer come stealing Dawn came later and the breakfast had to wait When the gales in November came slushing When afternoon came, it poured freezing rain In the face of a hurricane west wind When supper time came, the old cook came on deck She said, fellas, I should have to feed you Then at 7 p.m. a main hatchway came in Right, fellas, it's been good to know ya. Yeah. Then the captain wired in, he had water coming in, and his good ship and crew was in there for And later that night, when the ship's lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Does anyone know where the love of God goes With the waves to the minutes to hours? The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay If they put 15 more miles behind her She might have split up or she might have capsized Or she might have broke deep and it took water but all that remains are the faces and the names of the wives, the sons, and the daughters. Lake Yard Rose, Siberia sings in the rooms of her ice water mansion. Old Michigan steams like a young man's dreams. Her islands and bays are for sportsmen, and farther below Lake Ontario. Takes in what Lake Erie can send her And the iron boats go, as the mariners all know With the gales of November, remember In a rustic old hall in Detroit they pray At the Maritime Sailors Cathedral and the church bell chimed until it rang 29 times For each band on the Edmund Fitzgerald So the legend lives on from the chip on down Of the big lake they call Gitchigumi Superior, they said, never gives up her dead When the gales in November come early that I'd like to ask Reverend Kohler to uh, Father Kohler to uh, give us a benediction please it's uh, been a <clears throat> wonderful enriching evening in uh, July of 1701 
second in command was Alfonso de Tonti, and his wife was with child and delivered not far from these waters. So he presented her with a rose, being from Italy, he presented it in the traditional words, Noche Rosa sin Espina. There's never been a beautiful birth without the thorn, the pain that you've been through. So it kind of typified for me the beauty of this night with all the roses and there's still pain and sense of loss, but it's that beauty of life that we <clears throat> gather here tonight. I think all the mariners who are at peace, they counted the cost carefully. They also knew that their values and the maritime tradition would carry on through all of us, especially the youngest who are here tonight. I'm thankful for those people in my life that were in the maritime tradition. I had a cousin who was a traffic motorcycle cop. He left to learn the trade in Algonac and ended up building Chris Crafts. And he was my hero, just to be a, invited aboard at the Monroe Yacht Club, Boat Club, hard-working club. But that was the ship that he built. And he kept building bigger ones in the barn near Maybe, Michigan. One year he built it so big he couldn't get it out of the barn. <laughs> he had to disassemble the bridge. But wonderful memories, and I'm glad to see so many young people here tonight that we have a sense of loss, but that beauty of the rose fully opened was how we try to cope with loss in life. But you're going to get 20 years to grow and 20 years to blossom, 20 years to stoop, 20 years to decline. Unless you're Polish, you get another 20 years. <laughs> That's stole that. So memory or memorial means make me present. <clears throat> That's a very special occasion to know that none of these maritime heroes were lost, but they're very present to us tonight. It's a wonderful part of a real culture. So the maritime tradition has done us proud tonight. Of all the verses in the Bible, there's one sentence that I think says it all. The souls of the just are in God's hands. They seem, in the view of the foolish, to be dead. But they are in peace. So we wish that for you tonight. Whether you're on the high seas and calm waters or otherwise, all of this gathering tonight is proof positive of the beauty of life the thorn and the pain. But that rose that was presented by de Tonti to his wife, uh, the first European child born here, uh, was so impressive. He liked to brag when the natives asked, where are you from? He said, the boot, Italia, the boot, we got the boot. And the natives smiled, we got the hand of God on this planet. So peace be with you all tonight and let's keep this tradition going for the sake of Detroit culture. I'd like to thank you all for coming and I leave you now with these last words of my friend Willem Van Kirk. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a present. Thank you.